if not, we may have to go to dinner. Well, and I don't imagine that's a very popular decision. Well, it has, has, has been mentioned uh, several times this afternoon, the Canadian group has some competition. And uh, this afternoon, we're going to hear from the other side, or two other sides. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Ken Kellerman, who uh, was a member of the NRAO Cornell, the LBI group. Uh, Ken was educated at MIT and got his PhD from the California Institute of Technology. He spent the years 1963 uh, to 65 at Parks in Australia, and uh, since 1965 has been at NRAO. And almost immediately at NRAO, he became involved in the DLBI program. He has done many things. Uh, uh, he's been involved in observations of variable sources and uh, active in, in the development of the, the, you know, the very long baseline array and the very large array in New Mexico. So I'll uh, call on uh, uh, Dr. Kellman to give us the Cornell NREO side of the story. Thank you, Jack. I think listening to the uh, earlier <coughs> talks, Excuse looking me. back from the perspective of... Why do we have the microphone? Where is it? Oh, okay. Looking back from the perspective of 20 years later, the um, VLBI was a, was a technique that was just waiting to be discovered or invented in the, uh, in the 1960s. Um, it certainly was an idea that was around in number of independent laboratories. And I, I'm not sure, but from what I heard earlier, it was even independently uh, conceived in, in more than one place in Canada. I'm, I'm not sure about that. That was the impression I had from, uh, from some of the earlier talks. The, uh, what happened, of course, in, in the mid-1960s uh, was that commercial high-speed tape recorders and commercial frequency standards became widely available. And also at the same time, I think we all realized also about simultaneously that radio sources really were that small and you really did need baselines of hundreds and thousands of miles to, uh, to resolve them. Up until, um, up until then, it, uh, we thought that just uh, you know, baselines of a few kilometers and connected elements would be, uh, would be quite adequate. So all, all these things happened at the same time uh, and a, a number of different laboratories uh, got involved in the technique. There was the work in Florida, of course, which, uh, which has already been mentioned. Uh, the motivation there was to, um, to study the radio bursts from Jupiter. Uh, there was the paper that was published by the Russians, which was also mentioned earlier. Uh, that paper was submitted in January of 1965 and was published later that year. Uh, that contained a major error. They had concluded that the required stability of the independent oscillators depended on the baseline, which of course we now realize is not correct. Um, Matvienko, one of the authors, was, uh, was just in Charlottesville last week and I asked him about it. We discussed it before, but I asked him again and he just said it was a mistake. And um, I, I couldn't get any explanation of just how they reached that conclusion. Um, the idea was certainly floating around in Australia where they were doing independent um, um, interferometry, uh, using intensity interferometry. Uh, in Canada, of course, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the, um, what we did in the NRAO Corn Cornell uh, cooperation. And then there was the uh, somewhat independent MIT haystack effort, which, uh, which Bernie Burke will discuss. Uh, I noticed that from the very beginning in Canada, it was always referred to as long baseline interferometry, LBI. Uh, we we called it VLB, uh, for very long baseline. Uh, that was partly intended as a parody on the VLA, which is being developed at about the same time. Uh, one of the results of the cooperation, which has occurred in recent years, is we now have a, a single global term, VLBI, for, for very long baseline interferometry, which, uh, which I think everybody now uses. Um, as somebody mentioned earlier, I think it's also interesting uh, that the number of people that argue that, that it, it can't work I know that in, I must have been in the spring of 66, we had a visit from the, somebody from the Naval Observatory, the man in charge of their time and frequency section. 
who explained in great detail that the atomic frequency standards did not have sufficient stability. Uh, what he had missed was he was thinking of the absolute uh, stability. You take two, two frequency standards and turn them on and warm them up, their frequencies will differ by a certain amount. Well, that's not relevant, of course. What's important is how much the two drift during, during the integration time, and that's more than an order of magnitude better, and that's what makes VLBI work. I also remember uh, one of our early papers came back from the journal with a comment from the referee that we should explain in more detail how an interferometer with such a long baseline where the curvature of the Earth is important, how that works. It's obvious how a, if, there's a straight, if it's on a straight line, but uh, we should explain in more detail the effect of the Earth's curvature. And I just wrote back a one-sentence letter to the, uh, to the editor saying that the, the two ends of the interferometer form a, are two points, and like all other pairs of points form a straight line independent of what's in between them. Because he was, <laughs> he, he was happy with that and the paper got published. <laughs> The, um, my, my own motivation or involvement in VLBI came around because of my interest in, uh, in variable radio sources and, and self-absorption, uh, both of which argue that angular sizes had to be the order of a thousandth of a second of arc. Marshall Cohen became interested uh, because of um, his interest in scintillations and, uh, and lunar occultations both of which had experimentally indicated that some radio sources were, were very small. Uh, Barry Clark got involved just because of his basic interest in interferometry and doing new and clever things. And then we were later joined by Claude Baer, an engineer at NRAO, and Dave Johnsey, who came to Cornell from Australia, who was originally working in, in cosmic rays, and turned his interest into to radio astronomy. The, um, let me show you the, uh, summarize the, the our, our design philosophy, which um, differed in, in some respects, and in some respects is very similar to the uh, Canadian approach. So which way is the thing going to come out? Ah, there we go. Okay. Uh, we want to keep the, sim the, the system simple. The idea was to get, I think as Norm indicated earlier, to get some fringes, show that the technique works, and then later go on to um, to a more sophisticated system. And so we chose, we chose the uh, digital recording. And I was not aware until uh, earlier today that the original Canadian proposal was also for a digital system. And it was Alan Yen that uh, converted it to, a, uh, to the analog system. Uh, but using the digital system, of course, meant that we had a narrow bandwidth of 360 kilohertz. Uh, it was simple in the sense that we could just use an ordinary computer tape drive, 556 BPI, seven, seven track recording. Uh, to do the correlation, we used a general purpose computer. It was an IBM 360. But because of the narrow bandwidth, we needed a very large collecting area to get sensitivity. And, uh, and that's where the uh, Arecibo antenna became involved. Also, to improve the sensitivity, we decided to build a, a double sideband interferometer. And since we were using parametric amplifiers at the time, uh, we decided to use a degenerate param, uh, which meant having a, 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 a double sideband interferometer required a, uh, a, a locked, um, phase locked pump, which turned out to be a problem I'll come back to. And since we were working at uh, relatively low frequencies, we uh, just used a rubidium clock instead of trying to become involved in the more expensive and, uh, and more complicated hydrogen masers. The, um, we also used a technique similar to what Norm described of, of stopping the fringes uh, by uh, changing the frequency on a synthesizer at one end or the other, the interferometer. Since our recording time with the uh, computer tape drive was only three minutes, we, it was sufficient just to re, uh, put in a single frequency for the, for the whole three minute observation. But I, I do recall one incident where um, I was out at uh, Caltech helping Marshall Cohen observe, and Barry Clark was back in, in Green Bank. Incidentally, I, I, the director of NRAO has asked me a number of times since what, why I had to go to California. I was living in Green Bank at the time <laughs> to, uh, to observe. Um, but we, we had a run of, I think it was 36 hours. And after about 20, Marshall and I took turns every 12 hours or something like that. It was, it was kind of tiring. 
But after a few rotations and talking to each other, we realized that every time we were on the phone with the Green Bank, it was Barry Clark at the other end. And while we were exhausted, observing 36 hours halftime, Barry was there <laughs> working uh, straight through. And on the, very, on the very last run, 20 minutes before the end of this 36 hour run, one of us, I don't remember who, realized it was at 18 centimeters and the natural fringe rate was about a kilohertz. And so we were putting in the kilohertz at one end or the other to, to offset this. And we realized that we were punching the wrong buttons on the synthesizer. Instead of putting in one kilohertz, we were putting in 10 kilohertz, which meant instead of slowing the one kilohertz fringes down to zero, we were speeding them up to nine kilohertz. And how are we going to explain this to Barry? <laughs> but I, I, on the way back to Pasadena, it's a five-hour drive, Big Pine to Pasadena. On the way back to Pasadena in the car, um, we both realized that uh, well, you could do all this in the computer. You just wrote, multiply one data stream by, a, by a, a square wave of the appropriate frequency, and you could slow the fringes down to zero. We had no idea how to do it in practice but we were sure that Barry could handle it, which indeed he did. <laughs> and ever since then, we've been doing the uh, fringe rotation in the computer and not in, in synthesizers. Um, it took us 15 months from the, sort of the time that we first discussed the project to the time we had fringes, which I think is very close to what, uh, to what it took in Canada. And I think it's interesting, looking back now, to ask, well, you know, why did it take so long? Uh, the equipment was really all there. Uh, Particularly in our case, it was just a matter of assembling the, uh, the components, doing some software. Um, and it really, it really shouldn't have taken that long. Um, one problem that we had was just the late delivery of our commercial frequency standards. These are rubidium uh, frequency standards, which we got from Varian. Um, they were supposed to be off the shelf, they were in their catalog, but in those days, off the shelf meant that after they got your order, they would, they would start to build it. Um, and so that, that took a long time. The, um, the software development, of course, always takes longer than, than you expect. In our case, it was delayed even more so uh, because we were getting a new computer at NRAO. We had an IBM 7090, and that was replaced by a, by a 360, and the 360, was, the delivery was late, and so the software development was postponed. Um, our biggest problem was in the use of this degenerate paramp and the, um, the multiplier system, which we used to get the, 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 the lock doubler. Uh, that just never worked right and caused us all sorts of grief. And uh, with hindsight, that was, that was just a big mistake. Um, we're also, as Norman uh, suggested, over-optimistic. After we did the bench test, uh, it seemed to work. And we knew it had to work. I mean, the, the oscillators were stable enough. Um, the data coming off the, um, off the tapes is the same as it would be if it had been connected directly. Barry says it has to work, and we shipped everything off to Puerto Rico uh, instead of trying some local tests. Of course, it didn't work. Um, we went back and forth several times on that. The, um, I think it, it's also clear now, looking back, that um, I think VLBI could have, done, could have been done some years earlier. The, um, if it had, first of all, been appreciated that they really were such small sources, um, the frequency standards, which were available even some years earlier, as it turned out, would have been adequate. Uh, a year or so after we did our first experiments, I remember just trying some uh, commercial crystal oscillators, frequency standards, and they worked fine. Uh, even at six centimeters, uh, got coherence for, uh, for three minutes or so. So um, it all could have been done earlier, but, but it wasn't. I tried to put together um, some of the major benchmarks in, in our program. The, um, the first serious discussions, actually they weren't too serious, were um, occurred in, in the summer of 1965 at the meeting of the American Astronomical Society in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, one evening, Marshall Cohen and I just sat down, had a few pitches of beer, and we decided that uh, it should be possible to build an independent oscillator tape recording interferometer. Um, we talked to Barry Clark, and he said, sure, uh, he can do it, and he did. Um, as Norm implied, one of the important things is to have the, have the support of your director. And uh, 
I remember going into Dave Heeshan's office in, it must have been August or September, and just telling him that Marshall and I had had this beer, and uh, we'd like to do this thing. He said, how much is it going to cost? I said, $100,000. And he took out a big black book, and he looked at it. I could see his, you know, he looked he very frowned, and uh, just almost got ready to, to walk out. And he looked at me, and he shook his head, and said, well, I don't think we can handle that. Well, 50, this is in September or something, you know, a few months before the end of the year. He says, well, 50,000 do for the rest of this year. And you can have the rest in January. And uh, as Norm said, that could not be done today, I think. You have to go through committees, uh, write proposals. Oh, he did say a few days later, why don't you write something down so I have it. <laughs> and it's good that we wrote it down, because uh, I think the, the date on that is, is very close to the, uh, to the time of um, of the report that we, we saw a little bit earlier. The, the first that I remember becoming aware, at least in detail, of what was going on in Canada was a discussion that I had with Norm in, in December at um, what was probably the Zero Texas Symposium uh, in Miami Beach. Uh, and I certainly remember at that time discussing with Norm in, in some detail about what, what, what were each doing. I have a vague recollection, though, also that we were both in Australia in 1963 and 4, the beginning of 65, uh, that at least one night in the wee hours of the morning while we were observing at Parks, um, we kicked around this idea of an independent oscillator tape recording interferometer. Um, it was in, the, our project became formalized in, in January. This is a uh, memo that was issued by, by Sandy Weinreb uh, thing on this date, the following project has been initiated, and that was the uh, Arecibo interferometer. NRAO was implied, of course, and um, that, that, that was the, the formal start of our project. But certainly some work had been done earlier. I remember um, Dave Johnson and I going to, um, to Boston or Cambridge to visit Bob Vassot to talk to him about, um, about rubidium standards at the time. The, um, the first bench tests were done in October and November of 1966. In December, everything seemed to work. We shipped everything off to Puerto Rico to uh, try to beat the Canadians. We sent our engine, one of our engineers down there. Actually, he went down just before Thanksgiving. I just talked to him the other day, and he reminded me of what happened. He went down before Thanksgiving. The equipment never arrived. It was sent by Pan Am. He spent the whole time tracing it between Miami, Baltimore, and New York. And apparently Pan Am just kept shipping it around, but never got it to Puerto Rico. <laughs> and finally, we let him come home for the Christmas holidays to visit his family. Uh, the equipment finally did arrive. He went back in January. We had a run between Green Bank and Puerto Rico, which we found no fringes. He came back. Uh, he went down again in February. We had a second run. Again, there were no fringes. Uh, finally, we retrenched and did what we should have done months earlier, brought all the equipment back to Green Bank, ran it between the two, el two, two of the elements of the Green Bank interferometer. And I don't remember the order. Uh, first is a, um, with just the regular Green Bank connected element inter uh, interferometer, connecting the outputs but using independent oscillators to show that the oscillators are really stable enough. And then there's a separate experiment uh, using the Green Bank in the local oscillator system, but using the, the separate tape recorders. And that worked. And then, of course, the two, the two together and all that worked. So um, everything, uh, everything seemed OK. And again, like here, uh, we became a little bit more conservative and then just did an experiment between Maryland Point and Green Bank, uh, which is about 228 kilometers or half a million wavelengths at 50, set, 50 centimeters. And that was on May the 8th. And then, of course, the, the, the Canadian work occurred about the same time, and the, the successful, very much longer baseline here. In June, we joined forces with uh, Bernie Burke and the M MIT Haystack Group. And I, I presume he'll give you the, um, um, the story that li leading up to that from, from what was going on at MIT. Uh, but we observed between Haystack and Green Bank at 18 centimeters at, uh, at 18 centimeters, 
which was a much, much shorter wavelength than we originally planned. We thought we were sticking our necks out at 50 centimeters, uh, which is a shorter wavelength than Canadians were using. Uh, but as it turned out, 18 centimeters was, was no problem. And we got the same resolution on this much physically shorter baseline as we would have had the originally intended experiment at Arecibo. And of course, also using a very much smaller antenna at uh, the haystack turned out not to be a problem. And we didn't really need all that collecting area at, uh, in Puerto Rico. Things happened very fast then. In August, there was a cross-country experiment at 18 centimeters, which increased the resolution to 20 million wavelengths. And then finally, under some pressure from Tommy Gold to get Arecibo involved, we did send the stuff back to uh, Puerto Rico at 50 centimeters and, and did a run there. Um, well, the, the, the um, Green Bank Haystack and, and uh, Hat Creek uh, was about the longest baseline you know, we could do inside the United States. That was at 18 centimeters. Um, the next step, since fringe stability seemed reasonably good, was to go to a shorter wavelength. Uh, we wanted to go to six centimeters. Uh, and we discussed doing this with, with Hat Creek. And I think it was sort of scheduled. And then at the last, then Hat Creek decided, and it was scheduled for January. And they decided if they change over to their six centimeter receiver in January, um, and they were doing mostly um, 21 centimeter work at the time, that uh, because of the bad weather out there, they might not be able to get their 21 centimeter receiver back till April. They lose all that observing time. And so they said they would not be able to do it. Uh, within days of when we heard this sad news, and we already had the time reserved in the 140 foot, and I think Haystack as well, we had a visit from Olaf Ridbeck from, from Onslaught saying that uh, he said that you know, they were interested in this, and someday you know, would we be interested in running an experiment in Sweden? And so we said, sure, how about January? And uh, it was only a few months. We rushed around as the NRAO people, the Haystack people, and, uh, and the Onsula group, getting all the equipment ready and everything. And we ran uh, successful experiments in January of 68, first at 18 centimeters, 35 million wavelengths, and then at six centimeters, uh, we, we hadn't even tried a shorter baseline at six centimeters. We went right to the intercontinental baseline of some 100 million wavelengths. And, uh, and then we did, later did, uh, did that to, um, to Hat Creek as well. So the, the baselines from Europe to the west coast of the United States were approaching a significant fraction of the, of the Earth's diameter. And it was clear that in order to do any better than that, we were going to have to go to even shorter wavelengths. The, the emphasis in those days was just on higher resolution. Uh, and there were no antennas in the United States that worked at shorter wavelengths than six centimeters. Uh, there was the ARO antenna, but that was too close. And uh, the, the only antenna um, that seemed like it would do the trick was one in the Soviet Union. And uh, so Marshall and I just sat down soon after this, this experiment. And we, we just wrote a letter to, to Vitkevich, who was the only person that we really knew there. Um, telling them what we've been doing, and we were kind of naive. I mean, we just said, you know, can we do, you know, would you be interested in doing an experiment sometime? Well, we never heard from them. Uh, months went by, and uh, we hadn't really discussed it with, um, with anybody in the United States, uh, except Dave Heeshan, the director of NRA. We just told him what we were doing. He said, sure, go ahead. Um, and then in July, I guess it was, um, we, we got this telegram. Is, we accept your proposal, joint experiment, with very long baseline deferometer. Please send technical documents, details, send letter, force, best regards. Um, they were all set to go. And uh, we, we hadn't done anything to, uh, to prepare for this. And uh, they, sent, um, they sent two people over um, in January of 69. Um, Matvienko and Mosiev, and we discussed and planned an experiment for October of that year, which we, uh, which we did, and which turned out to be uh, successful. It was years and years. We did that at six and three centimeters, but it was many years before we, um, before we got to our original goal of going to uh, the very short wavelengths of the order of, um, of, of one centimeter. The um, Norm told the uh, 
story of the, or somebody did, I can't remember who, maybe, uh, of the um, problem, you tell it, the problem you had with the um, clock at the airport. The, uh, we have the same problem in Leningrad. Uh, our clock stopped in, uh, in Russia. And uh, the Swedes agreed to send us a running Rubidium clock. They just bought a seat on, a, on an airplane, strapped it to the seat, and sent it over from, from Stockholm to, uh, to Leningrad. And I, I went to the Leningrad airport to pick it up. And the, uh, it was in a big wooden box. And the customs guy insisted on opening it. I had some screwdrivers in my pocket or something. So I just opened the box. It, it did, it didn't, fortunately, it didn't say atomic clock on it. We learned by that time you don't use that term. But um, here's an American in Leningrad Airport. And I opened the box. And if you remember, the HP Rubidium clock is a big clock right in the face. It's going tick, 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 tick. <laughs> <And he> says, <laughs> OK. <laughs> and, um, and so that, that experiment. Uh, Work. That, that was great fun. I think over the years, we, um, I don't think we got too much science out of the experiments we did with the Soviet Union. Uh, and we did it, we've done a number of them. We, we, we've got papers that we published and everything, but certainly it's not been worth, in, in terms of the scientific return, it's not been worth the, uh, the very great effort that was, that was involved. But in terms of the opportunity to, uh, to work with scientists from the Soviet Union, and, and I mean really work, you know, for, for weeks at a time. Uh, it's been quite an experience, and I think uh, it's something, if everybody in our two countries could, our two countries, I mean the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, would have the opportunity to work with their colleagues, their respective colleagues in the other country, I think the world might be a, a much better place to live. Um, 20 years later, we can look back and asked, you know, what we did right and what we did wrong. Um, I already, here's a list of what we did wrong. Um, I already mentioned that we were over-optimistic and we didn't do uh, sufficient local tests. It just, just ran off the long baseline. And that certainly caused us ma many months uh, delay. Uh, during those first few years, I think we put too much emphasis on observing lots of sources. Is getting fringes on lots of sources, rather than studying a few sources in detail. Um, I don't know about the others in our group, but I certainly had a, a mindset that all the compact sources were spherically symmetric, because they were expanding shells, which is the model that we used to interpret the, the variability. And so you could fit everything with a, with a simple Gaussian. And so even though in our data there were points that uh, clearly did not fit a Gaussian, um, we always dismiss them. Um, it's very easy to explain why VLDI data give uh, low points. B bad timing, bad correlation, uh, dropouts on, on, on the recordings. There are lots of things that give you uh, lo low visibilities. And so any points that were low compared to the simple Gaussian model, we just, we just ignored. Um, we just didn't believe our data, and that was a mistake. We didn't believe the Canadian data either. The Canadian group had published, or certainly talked about, and I think later published, uh, very complex visibilities, which, you in, which were interpreted as complex sources. And we didn't believe that either. That, that was certainly a mistake. Um, the first system, which is, was a simple digital system, uh, using the uh, computer tape drives, that was a good thing. But then we wanted more bandwidth. We were jealous of the broad bandwidth that you, you had here in Canada. So we decided to use TV recorders, but we would still record digital data. Uh, Alan Yen told us, don't use VR660s. They're <laughs> terribly complicated and unreliable. But we used VR660s for several years, and that, that was a disaster. Um, we also tried, it was, and the disaster was compounded because we tried to save money by using surplus magnetic tape. Uh, we literally had thousands of pounds of, of this stuff which we finally ended up, we couldn't even get rid of, we finally ended up digging a big ditch with a bulldozer in Green Bank and burying it. It's still there. <laughs> it's a monument to the LBI. Hey, what do we do right? <coughs> I think I mentioned we, we just bought sort of off-the-shelf rubidium standards rather than get involved with, uh, with hydrogen mazes. That was certainly the right thing to do at the time. Um, hydrogen mazes were very unreliable. Um, 
again, using the narrow band digital system at least gave us something that, uh, that worked. And, and gut fringes was relatively simple to develop. It didn't involve this thing that we needed with the, with the analog system. Um, also, when the Mark II system was developed, we, um, after the VR660, we went to the Allen Clutus in to use the IVC tape recorder. And I should mention that later on, he was also the one, uh, the first to develop the uh, video cassette recorder uh, for VLBI, which we, which we later adopted. And that was really the first really, I think, reliable uh, VLBI system. And that system uh, was sufficiently simple and cheap that it could be copied and made widely available to observatories all over the world. And I think that's where VLBI really came into its own when we stopped running around. It was great fun you know, running around carrying atomic clocks and to, to all sorts of interesting countries and places and carrying tape recorders. We didn't actually carry the tape recorders. We carried the clocks. The tape recorders we had to ship. But um, that was great fun. Things happened very fast and, and it was very exciting. Uh, but other than getting fringes and measuring rough sizes, which was important, um, we weren't um, getting too much science done. Uh, but the, the Mark II system, which was a combination of the TV-based system originally developed in Canada and the digital system that we used, uh, was sufficiently simple that there's, I think there's something like 30 uh, such systems that are available in the world today in, in some 15 different countries, including China and Japan, the Soviet Union, um, all completely compatible. Uh, there's never been any international committee or any IAU or ERSI committee that said this is the system that we're going to use, or, or any uh, director or boss or, or committee. Uh, it just sort of happened. And everybody adopted the same system. It happens to be based on the US or North American uh, TV standards, uh, but it's used in, in Europe and, and, and Asia and the Soviet Union which is more than you can say for, for the commercial people. Um, I mean, you've got two different voltage standards all over the world. You've got two different uh, frequency standards. The European VLBI system runs on 60 hertz, not, not on, on 50 hertz. And you've got uh, the commercial TV industry has, um, well, I guess there are three main TV systems, the North American system, the German, PAL, and CCAM from, from France. Uh, there are at least two recording technologies, uh, VHS and Beta. And I wasn't aware of it until I, I saw this on here earlier that there's apparently another system, VHR, I don't know what that is. But three recording systems and three TV systems, there's nine different combinations. And the commercial people have never been able to, to, um, to pick on one and, and use it. It's not a matter of whether one's better than another or not. You could have one standard. And the VLBI community has done that. And I think that's, uh, that's quite an accomplishment. Okay, thank you very much. sometime after May the 8th and sometime before the Ursi meeting because we had that result but 
Canadian group that had the Ottawa to Ottawa experiment prior to that, and then just after ours, the much longer baseline across country, which we didn't have until uh, August or something. So things, things sort of uh, <coughs> back and forth. I'm not really sure of the exact dates. The dates of the ARO Shirley Bay observations were May 16th to 20th, uh, after your observation. But wait, 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 Shirley Bay is, is uh, near here, right. 16 to 20, but the RC meeting was the 22nd. Well, the tapes from Penticton had been recorded before that, right. but the figures not found. They were recorded uh, oh, April 13th, okay. 16th. Right. right. So is it, you got the fringes on the short baseline, and that spurred you on to going back and finding the fringes on the longer baseline. Yeah, we didn't have to be taken. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's right. This is the key thing, in fact, when the fringes were found, rather than That's right, absolutely, the absolutely. So we know the date on which we got the fringes. That was the 21st of May, is that right? <coughs> was it, was that? Was it was the 21st, the date of the Ottawa to the ARO fringes? But you must the Ottawa to Ottawa was just days before that then. No, it's Algonquin to Ottawa. It's as yeah. yeah. far away. Yeah. I know, but the Ottawa the internal Ottawa mm -hmm. was just days before that. Uh, sixteenth to twenty, yeah. Those tapes were played immediately. Right. And produced and right. Right. fringes immediately. Then Norman and Ellen went back to the earlier tapes between ARO and Penticton and found the fringes. Uh, do you remember, I wasn't at that RC meeting, but the Marshall report on... Marshall reported for your group. Yeah, but the new report on fringes between Green Bank and Aristotle. No, oh, sorry, Green Bank and, and Maryland Point. Yes, he did. Yeah. yeah. So we had, so that was three weeks after the observation. So sometime during that three weeks, we got the fringes. And I think it was before you got the fringes. Yes, I think. But when you got the fringes, you had a much longer baseline. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we, but we, we got the long baseline fringes first. Yeah. But you I also think we have the short baseline fringes first. Yeah, but you also, if we talk about the zero baseline, that is, you did an internal auto, uh, ARO experiment. Yeah. If you want, yeah. if you need 100 yeah. meters yeah. apart or something, right? Yeah. And, you, yeah. and that was done before our internal wing yeah. bike experiment. What was the baseline Maryland point to Greenland? <laughs> <laughs> How long was the baseline Maryland point to Greenland? 228 long. 228 <laughs> Anyway, it was February, right? We did ARO. February 6th. ARO. That's right. February 6th. It was, um, it was certainly not February. It was March, April. That we did internal to Lima. And then it was May, somewhere between 8 and 20, and I don't, I don't know where, but right? we did Lima and Maryland Point, June 28. And I was still in half the wavelength, which is still less than the resolution of God of Lane we've gotten with her Lincoln now. And then you did uh was the twenty-first time um the the RO and <coughs> that's when four and five four or five that's when the fringes were found. The observations were were taken on some May sixteenth to twenty. And it wasn't until June. April fifteenth, sixteenth. April 13th to 16th. <clears throat> and then in June, we did the uh, ASAC The first three months are 66 on the year. It's all 66, yeah. Huh? 67. 67. all 66. February 6th.
issue because it strikes me as you said, we could have, we had the gadgetry around <coughs> to do this kind of thing. But the point is, had the quasar not been discovered five years earlier, it may well have been the case. But that was the problem with resolution you couldn't get the old hard light barometers. Had you not found those things in 1960, you might have gone right on along with standard railway track kind of barometers for any number of years, and they never nope. occurred to anyone. Nope. Not true. Before. Well, not true. Uh, as you may know, the, uh, I mean, the intensity of the barometer was developed by Hanbury Brown to do radio services. Uh, about the time that they got the thing working, they realized everything, the kind of radio source that they were looking at at the time were uh, resolved on moderately short base lines. And they thought the technique just wouldn't be needed, and they just turned it to optical astronomy uh, and never pushed it into radio. But it was developed for radio astronomy to be used in transatlantic base lines. At that time, um, it was thought the radio sources were stars be very small. By the time they got it working, we found out that things like Cygnus A was about a minute of arc. And it wasn't until um, the early and mid-60s that there was the self-absorption and the variability and the connected element in the parametry uh, that we started to realize that there were things that were very much smaller than the second bar and the bar that was the baseline. But certainly that was a case where a little bit of knowledge hurt would have been better off just blasting the head with the technology. You heard of me, Bernie? Hmm? You don't agree with that? Or? Well, I have my own scenario. Okay, <laughs> we'll hear that. I was asking what, how Tony Hughes' experiments fit into this in determining small sizes using the control scintillations. Yeah, I, I mean, Marshall Cohen had been doing that, uh, and that was where his, his interest in the LBI developed. Because, uh, okay, this, this, didn't, this certainly came before the LBI. Oh, yeah, that, that, that was in uh, the early 60s. So it was, that was a working technique by. Uh, by the mid 60s. Marshall Cohen was doing that as well as Tony Hughes. Well, by, by the mid 60s, lots of people were doing it. Yeah. I mean, Tony he certainly was invented, or discovered in, in Cambridge. That was in 60, I think. And so by, by 1964 or so, lots of people were doing it in lots of places. <coughs> Thank you very much. 